Amen. Welcome. Let's go ahead and come on in. Get ready to praise the Lord and stand up.
You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Bubakar Tiam, and I have the privilege to welcome you to our service this morning. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. When you see the snow coming down, 10, 11 inches, what a powerful name it is, you know. But God knows what we need. He knows what we want, you know. Kids haven't seen snow in years, and seeing the snow coming down, you make it more of be grateful to God for what he gave us, you know. And full disclosure, I'm not a big snow guy, but I really appreciate it that God think of us, and he bring that for us. To let us know how much you care. Amen? Amen. We're going to have a great service this morning. And for you guys at home, welcome to our service this morning. If you can open your Bible to Psalm chapter 103. I just want to show us how much God cares. How much he loves us. Psalm 103 in verse 1. And there it says, Praise the Lord my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sin deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. Wow. This is the kind of God that we came here this morning to praise, to worship. A God that loves us, that cares so much for us. And I pray that uh, as we get together this morning, our heart is to give it our best. Let's praise him. Let's give him glory, the glory that he deserves now and forever. We're going to have a great service this morning. In a few minutes, uh, Brandon Miller will come and share God's word about the cross. And then Tim have a message for us that I hope will encourage us and lift us up for the rest of the week. So with that said, let's go to, in prayer before we continue our worship. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you represent, Lord. You are such an amazing God. And you love us despite all of our shortcomings. You don't look at our sins and condemn us, but you forgave us. You forget. And I pray that as we come together this morning, our heart is to give you the glory that's due to you. That we want to thank you so much for what you've done and continue doing every day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your gracious righteousness that you pour upon us. I love you so much. 
for listening to us. And I praise your holy name. It's your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a few announcements for us today. And if you're watching online, I know there's a lot of you online today, so uh, we'll be emailing out the announcement list as well. But I wanted to start it with this Wednesday. We will have our women's midweek here at 7 o'clock. I love any time that we get together with the women, so plan on being here at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And then, again, I wanted to remind you that the 2022 Singles Fellowship Weekend registration is open. That will be in Kansas City and a fun time. And then we have all the details of our marriage retreat coming up in March. So March 11th through 13th, we'll be going to Branson, Missouri. All married couples are invited, and we would love to have you join us for the whole weekend. So Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday we'll have our own worship service there as well. So we will actually be opening up registration after church today. Katie Werner will be out in the foyer. She'll have a flyer with all of the information, but the registration cost is only $40, and then there are three different room options for you to choose from. So it ranges from $73 to $153. Uh, depends on which kind of room you want. So all the description will be on the flyers that we'll have for you. Um, And then it will also be on our website. You can register online after tonight. So we'll get that all set up tonight. And you can register online for the retreat. And then you have to call the hotel, which you can do later this week, to book your rooms. So we're super excited. Doug and Angela Wins from the Greater Houston Church will be coming in and doing our marriage retreat for us. Springfield is joining us, and I think now some of St. Louis is joining us as well. So it'll be a great time. We have a super large meeting room, so there's plenty of space and plenty of space to spread out, but you'll be together with your spouse for the majority of the weekend, which is awesome because we all need that time away. And if you have kids that need to be watched, we have a lot of campus sisters who would probably be willing to help you out there if you ask them sooner than later because they'll get snatched up. And Cynthia is available. So some of our singles, some of our campus, um, yeah, do you know, if you want to, they can help you out. You can kind of help them out, maybe get to vision later this summer. So anyway, just putting that out there. Um, But we're super excited about the marriage retreat. It's all coming together. The place is gorgeous. And I just love marriage retreats, so I love being together. So anyway, there are a few more announcements. Please keep all the prayer requests in your prayers. Miss Janet um, was diagnosed with COVID this week, so she's kind of been struggling with that, but I think she's doing a little better. Okay. Um, So yeah, so if you can just look at the prayers and keep those people in your prayers, that'd be awesome. That's all. Let's stand. is a 
of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise thing. And we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord And I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are. Recently, I just finished reading Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, which is a pretty good book. Uh, it's got a lot of nice analogies and descriptors of things. It's not anything, you know, mind-blowingly new, but it's a new way of hearing things. And so I wanted to read a little bit about this. So what he's talking about in this chapter is uh, talking about how humanity has kind of dug themselves into a hole, right, as a society and maybe even individually, you know, like we dug ourselves into this hole of, you know, how did the world get to be so crazy and weird like it is, right? And so we're in this hole and what do we do about it? And so that's kind of what, what he's talking about here. And so let me read. So he says, now what was the sort of hole man had got himself into? He had tried to set it up, uh, tried to set up on his own to behave as if he belonged to himself. In other words, Fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. Laying down your arms, surrendering, saying you are sorry, realizing that you have been on the wrong track, and getting ready to start life over again from the ground floor. That is the only way out of our hole. This process of surrender, this movement full speed astern, is what Christians call repentance. Now, repentance is no fun at all. It is something much harder than merely eating humble pie. It means unlearning all the self-conceit and self-will that we have been training ourselves into for thousands of years. It means killing part of yourself, undergoing a kind of death. In fact, it needs a good man to repent. And here comes the catch. Only a bad person needs to repent. 
but only a good person can repent perfectly. The worse you are, the more you need it, and the less you can do it. The only person who could do it perfectly would be a perfect person, and he would not need it. Remember, this repentance, this willing submission to humiliation and a kind of death, is not something God demands of you before he will take you back and which he could let you off if he chose. It is simply a description of what going back to him is like. And so that really struck me. I actually underlined it, and I don't, I don't ever mark books. But I thought that was really cool. That repentance isn't like, a, okay, I do this, and then God takes me back. No, that is how I get back to God, right, is, is I repent. And so I was thinking, okay, well, how do, I, how do I learn how to repent? And that's what part of the rest of the chapter talks about is, well, how do you learn to do that? Because we can get in this mindset of like, well, I'm, you know, selfish and I'm weak. And so all these people who are repenting are doing better. Well, it's easier for them because they already have this and that and all that. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. But I was thinking, okay, well, what's an example of repentance that I can look to? And so first mind is, okay, Jesus, because, I mean, he's a perfect example of everything. But it says right there, a perfect person doesn't need to repent. So I don't know. Don't want to get into a lot of it. Can Jesus be an example of repentance if he never had to? I don't know. So I was thinking, okay, what's the next best person? Well, maybe not the next best person, but another good person, David, right? Okay, David, someone, great man, man after God's own heart. He had to repent. He did some bad stuff, right? And so that's what we're going to look at is what he did, uh, like the sin that he did, and then the response to that. So this is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. So we can look at also, and I, w I won't, but we could also look at what repentance is not. And so if you look at Saul... He's a good example, you know, the dynamic duo, David and Saul, these two, uh, you know, contrasting people. That Saul, what, what did he do? He started out good, right, saying all the right things, but he stopped doing the right things. And whenever he would do the wrong thing, he would sin, he would justify it, right? He would say, I'm sorry, but then do all this. Like, I was waiting for you, Lord, and I waited so long, I didn't know it was going to happen, so I just did this anyway. Right, he would justify himself. And if you're having to say, I'm sorry, but you're not really apologizing, right? You're not really repenting, right? And so you can read all that First Samuel, what Saul does. That's a good example of how not to repent. So, okay, how do we repent then? So in Second Samuel chapter 11, the chapter before this, there's like two or three big sins, in my opinion, that David did. And this is one of those, uh, which is Bathsheba, right? So instead of being this great war hero like David always been, he stays at home and he sees a woman uh, bathing, and then he's like, all right, she's a pretty woman. The logical thing, obviously, is for me to take her, kill her husband, and marry her. That's what he does, which is pretty horrible. And so the last verse of chapter 11, it says, but the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's an understatement, right? <laughs> so the Lord's like, okay, that's evil, what, David, what you did, David. And so what happens? So in chapter 12, starting in verse 1, says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and Nathan was the prophet at the time, and he came to him and said, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd. To prepare for the, uh, and that's he is and the rich guy is unwilling to do this. To prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. That's pretty gruesome. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely that man, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make a restitution for the lamb fourfold because of what he, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are the man, right? You are that guy. Thus, the Lord, uh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. And I could read this whole chapter, but most of the rest of this chapter is the Lord saying, I've done all this for you. Why did you do this, right? I did all this, and so because of what you've done, this is all the things that are going to happen. These are all the consequences of what you've done, and... How does David respond after hearing all this? He says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Yeah, you think? And this is the craziest part of this whole thing. And Nathan said to David, 
the Lord also has taken away your sin, you shall not die. And that's incredible. That comes, you know, right out of left field. That's uh, like Boo read in Psalm 103, right? He does not deal with us as our sins deserve, right? He doesn't treat us that way. And so what is repentance here? I mean, you could, the Bible is kind of weird. It doesn't always give us the best description of, oh, this is how the person said it. They pleaded, they were crying on their knees. Sometimes you get that, sometimes you don't. And we just say, David says, I sinned against the Lord. And you could read that, you know, straight faced, but this is the man who, didn't kill Saul, a man who was trying to kill him because he didn't want to sin against the Lord, right? And so when he says, I have sinned, you best believe David was feeling that, right? And you can read uh, Psalm 51, I think he wrote after this, explaining, you know, how he was feeling. He was torn up about this, right? He was really hurting from the sin he had committed. He, he knew the consequences, how it was affecting people. And so real repentance then is saying, I'm sorry, there's no buts about it. I'm not trying to justify anything. I screwed up, and I just have to own that, right? You take responsibility for what you did. And like C.S. Lewis said, that is no fun at all, <laughs> right? That's, it's not fun to do that. Uh, it, it sucks every time you have to repent. But it's not a, oh, you know, I'm, it's like a thing sitting here. Here's repentance. No, if you're trying to be with God, you have to repent, as long as you're not perfect, right? And we're all there, so we all have to repent in order to be with God. That's what it looks like, right? What does it have to do with this time here then for communion? Well, Jesus said, you know, do this in remembrance of me. The consequences of what David did is he lost that child with Bathsheba, right? So there was still a sacrifice demanded for that consequence. But then Jesus did all this stuff, right? He suffered, did all these things. He paid the price for it. And again, is not treating us, you know, the Lord is slow to anger and, you know, full, abounding in love and all that. And so that's what this time is about. It's a time for us to consider, okay, I'm, how am I living my life, right? How, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? What are the things I need to repent of? What, what, where's the sin in my life and how is that affecting me? And so that's my challenge for all of us. And it's a you know, not fun, big challenge is seriously think about that. Think, you know, what's the sin that I've been hiding? Even if it's like, you know, the smallest thing, right? To us, it's the smallest thing. Sin is sin, Right. And so if there's anything, any little thing, you got to repent about that, right? And that you, you were not going towards God if you're not repenting. That's the only way to get to God. The only way to be with him is if you do repent. So that's, that's our time here. That's why we do this every week is we think, okay, we recommit, we refocus our minds, we repent. We go back to God. That's what this is all about, right? With all that said, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for this uh, crazy uh, and kind of inconvenient but also beautiful weather, and just thinking about all the, just how big this world is, and that you, just with like a flick of a hand or just a word or just a, a thought, you keep all this going, you know, you maintain this whole world for us, Lord, and you maintain all of us, and so I pray, Lord, that we can recognize that, that we can just fully submit to you, Lord. That's really the only way we can get out of, you know, the, the horrible things that we do, Lord. If we were just on our own power, or at least if I was on my own power, I would not do anything good, Lord. And so it's just through your grace that I'm able to be here, Lord. And so I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And I pray that we can always keep that, that, that thought at the front of our minds, that we can always think of everything that you do for us and just live in gratitude for that and actually you know, put, put our money where our mouth is, you know, put, actually walk the walk, Lord. And I'm so thankful for everything that you do. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen.
Amen. For our contribution time, I want to kind of think about the mindset that David had after this point. So what goes along with, uh, in Psalm 51, all these things about, oh, this is how my sin was affecting me, I'm so sorry for this, was also a gratitude, right? He also praised God for being as great as he is and was thankful for that, right? He had this sense of gratitude. And so what did he want to do? He wanted to build a temple for God, right? And of course, David didn't get to do that, uh, but Solomon did. But the key there is that he wanted to repay God for everything that he did, right? And I think that's a pretty natural mindset to have, uh, to want to, you know, if someone does something really good for you, you know, you pay it forward, right? If you're in the line at like, I don't know, McDonald's or something, and someone pays for your meal, right? Then it starts that chain of like, okay, well, I'm going to pay for the person after me, and the person after me does that, right? That's kind of how people are. And maybe this isn't true, absolutely, but I feel like this is. But if it's not, feel free to disagree. But I feel like there's two, people are primarily givers or takers, right? And one kind of subsedes the other. So if you give a lot, you tend to not want to take. And if you take a lot, you tend to not want to give. Uh, at least to me, that seems to be true. You're one or the other, and doing one stops the other one. So we don't want to be takers, right? The, if you even look at what Nathan, the little parable that Nathan gave to David, the man had you know, all this stuff, all these animals, and some guy comes in. He only has to sacrifice one animal to feed them. But he's like, ah, I don't want to get rid of all this stuff. I'm going to take from the guy who's only got the one thing. And we recognize that that's evil, right? That's not good. And so not to say taking as a whole is evil, but it's certainly closer to that than giving is, right? And so why would we want to be takers when we can be givers, right? And when you give, God loves a cheerful giver. So we should be grateful when we give. That's, I feel like that's the, the mentality to have, right? You don't give out of obligation. I mean, you can also do that, but it's more fun when you feel gratitude for it, right? And so that's also why we do this every week. We try to be grateful. We try to live that out and say, Lord, this is all the things that you've done for me just this week. You know, really, really think about that. Like, when you, whenever you give, which I give on, you know, automatically, so it's not something I have to sit there and think. But I should think every week, this is what you've done for me, Lord, and why would I feel bad about giving you however many a week, right? Well, what is that in the, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to everything that you do and everything that there is in the world, right? And everything that you could do through me, through that, right? So with that, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, again, I thank you so much for everything that you do, and I pray that we can be grateful for what you do do for us and for everyone here, Lord, and that we can honor that. We can give you something to bless, Lord, that we can, you know, pay that forward. We can say, here's what you've done for me, Lord, and now I'm going to honor that. I'm going to respect your love and be loving in kind, Lord. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Let's get, uh, get up to our feet. Worship the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. I sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your name. Slow to anger, 
Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore come on bless the lord oh my soul Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. I sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back with you guys. I was a little under the weather last weekend. And uh, it's about time, I know, that's how I feel. My voice is still, I got a frog in my throat this morning, so uh, excuse that if I need to uh, drink a little water here. But uh, I want to welcome you once again to Heartland Church, and uh, just excited to be together. And uh, as has already been mentioned, we saw this beautiful display of God's handiwork this weekend. Um, so that's always encouraging. But, uh, you know, it's just great to be together. Th things are good, right? I mean, there's challenges, but things are good. We got a beautiful snow this week, but this morning the sun is shining bright. The Razorbacks won again last night, and yeah, things are good, amen? <clears throat> but, uh, you know, while we were on our sabbatical this summer, my wife and I had the opportunity to just take some time to uh, kind of decompress and unplug, and so I read some books about God's design for Sabbath rest in our lives, and I heard a story in one of these books, and it was about this man who was seeking solitude. He, he just needed to kind of get away from everything, so he decided to become a monk, all right? And uh, this man, he went to this monastery in the Alps, and he just said, okay, I'm just going to go, and I'm just going to devote myself to God, and I'm going to become a monk. And upon arrival, he met with the head monk, whatever that person is called. I think it's an abbot, right? Is that the head monk? Anyone know? Um, so anyway, he met with this, this head monk, and he said, hey, there's some important things that we do here. You know, we work hard. It's a community you go to. But he goes, one of the most important things we do is we all take a vow of silence. And he said, every year, if you complete your vow of silence, you get to say two words. So, you know, this was different for the guy, but he's like, okay, this is what I came here for, to get this solitude. And so the man went about his new life, eager to see what lie ahead. And after the first year, the senior monk called this young monk in, and he said, you know, you've been here for one year now. You haven't said anything. You have two words. What would you like to say? The man thought for a minute and he said, bed hard. 
Okay, so another year goes by, right? He's working in the monastery. He's doing the things he's supposed to do. And after another year, he comes before the senior monk. And the senior monk says, my son, what, what would you like to say? What have you learned this year? What are your two words? The man said, food bad. The third year came and went. Again, the man's out doing everything that the monks are doing in the monastery. And he comes before the senior monk and he says, my son, what would you like to say this year, your third year? And the man says, I quit. The senior monk thinks for a minute. He goes, well, I'm not surprised. All you've done is complain since you've been here. <laughs> Perspective is important, right? Um, amen. We're, we, you know, this year we're talking about following Jesus. Come follow me. And here's the good news. You can say more than two words, okay? So I'll take that pressure off of you. But, you know, today uh, it's actually an exciting time. We're going to witness a young man who's answering this call to come follow me. Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we're going to see that this morning as Elijah is going to be baptized at the end of our service. Amen. But, you know, we're excited this morning also to continue our series in Matthew. We've been going through Matthew for quite a while now, and that's going to be our theme and our, our focus for a while. Our theme for the first part of the year, of course, is come follow me. But today we're going to be jumping into the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And hopefully you've been reading along through the book of Matthew. Um, if you read a chapter a day in January, you've finished the book of Matthew already. If you haven't, it's not too late. You can start today. Matthew is still there waiting for you. Amen? But, um, you know, in Matthew 4, 17, we read this a few weeks ago, but it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know, Brandon talked about this, this concept of repenting earlier today, and, and the word for repent in Greek, it's metanoia, okay? Metanoia, and literally what it means is meta means change, like metamorphosis to change shape, right? But meta means change, and noia is mind. Um, and, and so it literally means to change, I think I've mixed up the words there, but it says to change your mind. Metanoia, repent. You know, to truly follow Jesus, it requires a change of our mind. What does it look like to change the way we think, to, to completely think differently? And, you know, repentance, it's not just veering off the course that you're on. It's a 180. It's a complete reversal. It's like I was heading this way, and then Jesus came into my life, and now I'm heading this way. A complete reversal, of course. But you think, okay, why here? Do, why does Jesus tell them to repent? And, and, you know, as Brandon shared, we all need to repent, right? Every one of us has times and, and probably every day that we need to repent and change the way we think about some things. But throughout the gospel, we'll see this phrase, and, and Jesus says, repent, why? For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And you see this phrase, kingdom of heaven, used, there's another phrase that's used called the kingdom of God, okay? You see that in the gospels as well, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is used 68 times in the New Testament, the kingdom of heaven is used 32 times in the New Testament, but the kingdom of heaven is only used in the Gospel of Matthew. So you might wonder, okay, why does Matthew write the kingdom of heaven, and why do the other Gospel writers also include the kingdom of God? Well, Matthew was writing to a mostly Jewish audience, and he's talking to them, and he's telling them about this kingdom. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is coming. And he, so he talks about the kingdom of heaven. That was more relatable to the Jews because they were waiting for this kingdom to come. And, you know, the Jews thought that it was going to be a physical kingdom, right? They thought, man, Jesus is going to come in. He's going to have a sword. He's going to be on a horse, and we're just going to slay the Romans. And, and it wasn't that at all. It wasn't a physical kingdom, but it was literally the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven breaking into the present age. Not a physical kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom. These other kingdoms are going to be around but in the midst of that, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is breaking in. And, you know, there's a scripture in uh, 1 Peter 2, 11, and, and Peter kind of alludes to this. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. The thought here is, is we're not meant to be in this earthly kingdom. We, we are foreigners. We are strangers in this earthly kingdom because we're a part of a new kingdom the kingdom 
of heaven. Aliens and strangers here. But Jesus says, hey, you need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you want to be part of Jesus' kingdom, you have to repent. The Sermon on the Mount is is Jesus beginning to teach, hey, what's it going to be like to be part of his kingdom, part of the kingdom of God? And these teachings that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, they're, they're not just ideals, right? Sometimes people look at things in the scriptures and say, well, yeah, that's, a, that's an ideal. It'd be great if, if we could do that, but nobody can do that, so we're not even going to try. No, th- these are expectations that Jesus lays out for us. In fact, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, he talks about the wise man and the foolish man. You remember that story? And it says, the wise man built his house on the rock, and the foolish man built his house on the sand. And what Jesus says is anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The man that built his house on the sand, he says, it will fall with a great crash. You see, if we we think we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God, but we're not really willing to put into practice Jesus' words, not really willing to live it out, we're just deceiving ourselves. And we're building this spiritual house, so to speak, that's going to fall with a great crash. The Sermon on the Mount, it's not just an ideal, it's an expectation for our lives. And you know, Jesus is either your Lord or he's not. There's no gray area. There's no in between. It's not like, well, he's my Lord some of the time. Well, then he's not. You can't do it your way and say that Jesus is your Lord. Now, Again, Brandon discussed this earlier. We're not going to be perfect, right? We we cannot always live out every command. We we try. That's the goal. Man, that's our goal. That's the standard is what Jesus said. That's why we need God's grace. That's why we need God's mercy and his forgiveness. That's why Jesus went to the cross. But the Sermon on the Mount is the way of the cross. The Sermon on the Mount is not just what Jesus called us to do, but how Jesus lived. And brothers and sisters, Heartland Church, we need to be a church that lives like Jesus called us to live. We need to be a church that will answer that call, come follow me. There's churches out there that that aren't really serious about it. I don't think you, and and I know I don't want to be that church. Not that we're better, not that whatever, but but, we're going to live out the commands of Jesus. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on for the next several months here is is committing ourselves, recommitting ourselves to answer that call of Jesus to come follow me. Not just churchgoers, not just religious people, but but true disciples of Jesus. Amen? And I don't know about you, but when I humbly stand before, well, I do know about you. if, If we humbly stand before God and look into his word, it challenges us. And it it challenges us down in our hearts, deep in our core. When when we really try to live out Jesus' commands, we will be challenged and we will be changed. So the Sermon on the Mount, let's jump in here. And now, you know, the Sermon on the Mount starts with this beautiful passage that we call the Beatitudes. One of the most famous passages of scriptures, right? You hear quotes from the Sermon on the Mount at different times. And uh, this word beatitude, um, it it starts with that, and it's from a Latin word. So the word beatitude is not actually in the scriptures, okay? There's a little subtitle in a lot of our Bibles that say the beatitudes, right? That's not part of the text. That was just something that they said, oh, this is what Jesus is talking about. But it it means beati sunt, which is blessed are, okay? Now that is in the beatitudes. Many times Jesus said, blessed are the dot, 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 for they will be dot, 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 right? Um, So anyway, he starts off with the Beatitudes, and I think the reason he starts off with the Beatitudes is because he's like, if you're going to do the rest of these things that I'm going to talk about, you got to get down to the heart. We got to start at the core. And and so that's what we're going to read in the Beatitudes today. Um, Get to the heart of the matter. And if you're like me, sometimes you just want to know what to do, right? You get a new job, you're like, hey, just tell me what I need to do. Let's just get in there. Let's just get the work done. And And sometimes we can be that way with God. Like, just tell me what I need to do. Give me the checklist because I want to check the boxes. I want to make sure I'm right with you. you And and, and Jesus is like, this is not about what you need to do. It's about who you need to be. 
we can check all the boxes and still miss the heart, right? I mean, we see the Pharisees. They, they knew the scriptures better than anyone. They were the most religious, man. They had everything down. They knew all the boxes to check. And yet so many times Jesus says, I don't even know you guys. You're not part of the kingdom of God. And I, I don't want to be a modern-day religious Pharisee. That, that we go to church and we know the boxes to check and we know the things to say and we know the music to listen to. And the... No, we need to be who we need to be. The be attitudes, we need to be them. These embody these, these attitudes that we need to have in our lives. And again, these are for everyone. <clears throat> this is not pick and choose the ones we're good at, right? Well, man, I really like verse 4. I'm really good at that one, but 6, uh, I'm not so good at that one, right? Jesus says, no, this is who you need to be. The Beatitudes are countercultural. They, they go against what's ingrained in us in our culture. You know, our culture is, it's, it's all about you. You're number one. What can Brown do for you? No, this, is, this goes against that completely. It's counterintuitive. There are things that we're going to talk about today that it's like, well, no, I thought we should have done this. And it's, it's counterintuitive. It goes against the way we think. That's why Jesus said you got to change your mind. You guys remember a movie called The Karate Kid? Good movie, right? That's when I was growing up. We had the original one. But Mr. Miyagi, right? You got Daniel's son, and he gets into a scrap with some guys, and he just wants to learn more karate. And he meets Mr. Miyagi, and he goes to him. And what Daniel's son wanted to learn was all the cool moves. Teach me how to punch. Teach me how to kick. Teach me how to fight. Teach me how to, you know, destroy these guys. And so he goes to Mr. Miyagi, and, and Mr. Miyagi doesn't teach him those things. Mr. Miyagi says, go wax my car. Wax on, wax off, right? Go paint my fence. Brush on, brush off, you know, up and down. And, and, and so Daniel gets frustrated because he's like, that's not what I came here to do. I came here to get the goods, man. You see, Daniel was focused on what to do. And Mr. Miyagi said, no, you need to focus on who you need to be. These things that I'm teaching you are going to become so ingrained in you. It's just who you are. So when you get in that fight, you don't have to think about what to do. It's natural. It's like you're going to do the right thing because it's been ingrained in you. Jesus wants to teach us who we need to be, not what to do. The, the what to do, that will come naturally if we're being who we need to be. Amen? Amen. So the Beatitudes, each Beatitude has two parts, all right? The first part of the beatitude is the posture, okay? That's the blessed are the meek, blessed are, you know, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the posture. That's the position that Jesus says you need to be. But then it comes with the blessing, okay? The blessing, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, right? So you have the posture and you have the blessing. Now, again, these are not commands to go and do something. Jesus doesn't say, go and be meek. He says, blessed are the meek. It's got to be who you are deep down. So let's talk about this word blessed for a minute, okay? This word blessed comes from a Greek word called makario, okay? Makario, makar is the root word there. The root word actually means happy, okay? Makar means happy. Um, but makario and blessed are it, it, it doesn't mean happy in the traditional sense, right? We will be happy if we are these things, but, but really it's deeper than that. It, it means in a favored position. It doesn't mean over bubbling with joy, but it means you're in a great place. You're in a great, you're in great shape if you are this, okay? So you think about those who mourn, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Are they happy? No, but they're in a great position. They're exactly where they need to be. So, so when he says blessed are, it's like, man, that's who I need to be. That's where I need to be. That's what that means, blessed are. All right, so let's jump in here. You guys have been waiting for a while, so we're going to jump right in. In Matthew 5, verse 1. Thank you. Matthew 5 and verse 1. says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Wow, poor? 
poor in spirit? What does that mean? I thought, I thought we were supposed to be rich in spirit, right? I thought Jesus wants us to be spiritual, and we're supposed to have the Holy Spirit and have the fruits of the Spirit. We should be rich in the Spirit. And this is so counterintuitive for us that we, that we think, man, I want to be more spiritual. I want to be rich in spirit. But, but Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. This word for poor here, okay, you're getting a little bit of Greek lesson today. And excuse my pronunciations, but um, to, tokoi is how you say this. Tokoi is the word for poor. And, and this doesn't mean poor is in just like not wealthy, right? Sometimes we think of poor as like, well, I'm a college student. I'm poor. I'm this, you know, and we, we don't understand this kind of poor, right? Th this kind of poor, it means completely abject poverty, having nothing completely lacking, deeply destitute, so poor as to beg for scraps. That, that's the poor that Jesus is talking about here. And, and what he's saying is that, that you got to be a spiritual beggar. you got to understand your spiritual condition. you you got to be poor in spirit. Like, man, I, I just want whatever I can get from God. If we don't understand our own poverty in spirit, we can't truly be dependent on God. To truly be rich in spirit, we must understand we, we have nothing. We are poor in spirit. You know, there's an example in the Gospels in Luke 18. We're not going to turn there. But the Pharisee and the tax collector. You guys remember that story? And the Pharisee stands up and he's praying. He's like, well, I'm grateful I'm not like that guy, you know, that tax collector, that sinner over there. And, and you see the contrast here of, of someone who thought they were rich in spirit and someone who was just a, a spiritual beggar. They, they knew they have nothing spiritually. Paul talks about in, in the New Testament, he says, I'm the worst of sinners. Paul the apostle, Paul the one that spread the gospel all over the known world at that time, he says, I am the worst of sinners. And, and so what Jesus is saying here is blessed are the poor in spirit. Not putting confidence in our own righteousness. You know, no matter how long you've been a disciple, how long you've been a Christian, are you poor in spirit? Are, are you a spiritual beggar? You're just like, God, whatever whatever I can get from you today. And not looking down on others. Not looking down on others that are in sin or others that maybe don't know as much as you or haven't been around as long as you. Like, you're no better. You're poor in spirit. That's the posture here that Jesus is calling us to is, is blessed are the poor in spirit. And what's the blessing that he says? He says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's who the kingdom of heaven belongs to. That's who it goes to. If you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, he says you got to be poor in spirit. Remember what he told us just before this? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay, Jesus, how do I get it? How do I get it? Do I be the most spiritual? He says you got to be poor in spirit. Are you poor in spirit? How would you describe yourself? Someone asked you, hey, what's your spiritual life? Oh, man, I read my Bible, and I've, I've read it this many times. i got this stuff memorized. And, or are you a spiritual beggar? You're just like, you know what? I'm like Paul. I'm the worst of sinners. I've been around for a while, but, man, I need God now more than ever. I, I just long for any morsel of God's word that I can get. You know, is that our hearts, that every, every day we're just craving to get a morsel, a nugget from God's word? I, I just need some time in prayer. Man, any time I can pray to God, make that connection with him. Just fellowship with the body of Christ. Man, I'm just, just begging for it. Do you understand your spiritual condition, that, that you're destitute, that you need God above all else? Imagine if every one of us had this mindset, if every one of us we're truly to be poor in spirit. Man, what could God do? How would our lives be different? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember I told you God's word's going to challenge us and, and change it? It's quiet in here right now because we're all like, yeah, that's me. Oh, man, I need to. Yeah, it's, this is convicting. This is challenging. 
This is why a lot of people don't want to do it, because it's tough. But it's what Jesus calls us to be, is poor in spirit. Now, the Beatitudes, they, they build on each other, okay? There's a progression we see here. And, and again, Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount with this because he's like, I can tell you what you need to do and all those things, but if you don't get the heart, if you don't get this in your core, none of that other stuff is going to matter. We're just going to be another Pharisee, right? So, so these are going to build upon each other. Let's look at the next one. Being poor in spirit, it's necessary for this next Beatitude to, to be current in our lives. He says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, what does this mean? What does this mean, blessed are those who mourn? We know what the word mourn means, right? Um, and at face value, I think it could mean a few things. It could be we're mourning over our own difficulties, our own losses, right? We've all lost loved ones. We've all had things happen in our lives that cause us at times to mourn. It. He could be talking about that. Um, could be mourning with others, right? We just a few weeks ago, we lost one of our sisters here, and, and we're mourning with the Martin family. We're mourning with one another, and he could be talking about that, and I think those are true, that when we mourn, God comforts us. Could be mourning over our own sin, and, and this is where I think it, it really builds on this last um, beatitude, is that when we see our spiritual condition, that, that when we see, man, I am poor in spirit, it, it causes a mourning in us. This word for mourning, it means a deep grieving, so severe that it takes possession of a person and cannot be hid. It, it just consumes us. Man, I need God so much. And, and we're just mourning. When we think about our sin, when we think about the things that we've done this week, you know, today, when, when we think about our, our distance at times from God, he's not distanced from us, right? But we distance ourselves from him. And, and there's this mourning that Jesus says must be there. And he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, if we're not poor in spirit, we won't mourn because we won't see our need. We're like, I'm pretty good. You know, you look around, the people around you, oh, I'm more spiritual than that guy. I read my Bible more than that guy. Share my faith more than that guy. You know, like Jesus says, no, you, you got you to gotta see your condition and you have to be mourning over that. You know, we see other examples of this in the scripture. In 2 Corinthians 7, I'll just re refer to this, but it talks about godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is you get caught in some sin or some things get exposed in your life, and yeah, you're ashamed, and you didn't want people to know that about you, whatever, and, and godly sorrow is like, man, I'm going to do whatever I can to get this out of my life, to repent, to change. Indignation, alarm, concern, readiness to see justice done. That, that's mourning over our sin. As, as was talked about earlier, David, in Psalm 51, he says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Do you have a broken spirit when you look at your spiritual condition? You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about that some people feel like, well, I'm not good enough to be a Christian. I'm not righteous enough. Yeah, you're right. You're not. And I'm not. None of us are. That's why we need God so much. And, and you're the exact person that God is looking for. The posture here that we see, remember there's a posture and a blessing. The posture is one of mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. And what's the blessing? They will be comforted. They will be comforted. Psalm 32, verse 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And how good does it feel when we really deal with something in our life and we really feel that connection with God again? Maybe we've been distant from him and, and we just deal with it. And we've mourned over our sin. We've been broken. And then God refreshes. Acts 3.19 says, Repentance leads to what? Times of refreshment. Even when you were kids, right? Remember when you were a kid and you did something wrong? Some of you guys not that long ago, maybe this week, right? And, and you, you did something wrong and you kind of get busted even maybe at times and then you, you get punished, whatever. But then it's like, whoo, man, I'm glad that's off of my back, you know? It's so refreshing when we repent, when we mourn over our sin. Amen? Let's move on here to the next beatitude. 
Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. There's a old, few Old Testament references to this as well. I'm in Psalm 37, 11, it says, But the meek will inherit the land. Zephaniah chapter 3, it talks about how God's going to remove the arrogant boasters and he's going to leave everything to the meek and the humble. You know, this is one of those beatitudes I don't think we like all the time, right? It's misunderstood. This beatitude, when people hear this, it's like the meek. What? You're going to be meek? And, you know, there's jokes made about this. I actually did a Google search for Blessed Are the Meek, and there's so many memes. You know, I don't know that they're all good, so I wouldn't go look for it. But, but there's so many memes out there about the meek, and it's like, Blessed Are the Meek. You know, they're going to inherit the earth. Yeah, when we're done with it, you know, kind of an attitude. And, and uh, it's just mock. People don't understand that blessed are the meek. They think it means weak, right? And so the Greek word for this, praise, meek, right there, <clears throat> it doesn't mean weak. What it means is controlled power, self-control, lowering yourself, submitting to God. You know, there's an example that's used about the meek, and it's about a stallion, right? You take a wild stallion, and it's got all this power, and just it's out of control, and then that horse gets broken, and it becomes rideable. It becomes teachable. A few years ago, uh, we took a trip to Wyoming with Harold, went up and saw his sister and uh, went to Yellowstone and we went to this restaurant, okay, it was a steakhouse up there and an old cowboy restaurant, it's been around for 100 years or so and we met this old cowboy and he was playing his guitar and, and uh, he talked about, he, he manages some of the herds, the wild herds that are out there on the government lands, okay, and, and he said, he had this movie, and so we watched this movie, and it was an amazing movie. It's called Unbranded, so if you've never seen it, there's some bad words in it, but other than that, it's a really good movie. It's an amazing movie, and these four guys graduated from Texas A&M, and they decided that they were going to ride horses from the border at Mexico in the U.S. to the Canadian border in the U.S. They're going to ride through the Rockies and through the Grand Canyon, but they weren't just going to ride horses. They were going to break and tame wild horses and ride them from one border to the other. And there's scenes in this, and this is a documentary, this is a true story. There's scenes where they're <clears throat> literally riding down into the Grand Canyon. And I mean, the, the trail that they're on is probably a little wider than this podium on a wild horse. I'm not walking down that trail. I'm, I'm definitely not riding a horse down that, and I'm definitely not riding a wild horse down that trail. But, but you know, it just shows us that... <clears throat> these horses can become meek. They still have just as much power. In fact, they probably have more power than than some tame horses, right? But that's what Jesus is saying about us. You don't need to be weak, but, but whatever power you think you have, you submit that to the lordship of Jesus. Jesus was meek. Remember what he said when he was arrested in the garden and Peter draws a sword and cuts the guy's ear off, and he says, don't you think I could call 12 legions of angels? Jesus was meek. Was he weak? No. He had all the power, right? He could have wiped it all out, but he restrained that strength in meekness. I would ask you this morning, are you meek? When it comes to God's word, are you humble? teachable, coachable? Do you have a learner's heart? You know, in your interactions with others, are you meek? With your spouse, are you meek? I don't want to be weak. We're not talking about weak. We're talking about meek. With your boss, with your employees, those you interact with on the road, those you interact with on the internet, when they get your order wrong at the restaurant, Those you disagree with on the topic of the day. Those who think different politically or on social issues or on pandemic issues. Are you meek? You know, listen to this description that James gives and tell me it doesn't sound like our world today that that could use some meekness. James 4 verses 1 through 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. 
You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You know, we don't like this word meek. We want to take what we want. We want to be right. We want our way. My opinion is more important than other people. But this is not meekness. You know, again, these are challenging scriptures. Man, we've read like these little lines and it's just like, oh my gosh. How can anyone do this? Blessed are the meek. And what's the blessing here? He says, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, does that mean we're going to have a bunch of stuff? Not necessarily, right? God gives us stuff that we need. That's fine. But in 2 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about we have nothing but possess everything. You see, when you really submit to God, you submit to his word, when you really become meek, God's going to bless your life in more ways than you could ask or imagine. God will meet all of your needs and then some. But if you try to take and fulfill your own needs, you'll never be filled. And that's going to lead us to this next and last beatitude that we're going to look at this morning. Matthew 5, 6. <clears throat> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. <clears throat> hunger and thirst <clears throat> for righteousness. You know, think about when you're hungry, like really hungry, right? Anybody ever fasted? Hopefully you have, right? We need to fast more. That's a good thing to be doing. But think about the last time you fasted. That, that hunger that starts to build in you, you know, for me, it's usually like 30 minutes in, right? It's like, I, I'm going to eat this big meal. I'll, I'm hungry already. I can't eat for 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever. <clears throat> Man, that, that hunger, you, you don't think about that because you know at any moment I could just go and get some food, right? But man, when you're really hungry or really thirsty, it's all you can think about. It's consuming. But he says, blessed are those who hunger thirst for righteousness. You know, does that feeling of hunger, does that describe your hunger for righteousness? Righteousness means to be upright, to be just, to be virtuous, to keep the commands of God. Is that your heart? Like, man, I am hungry. I'm thirsty to be righteous. Psalm 42, 1 says, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. You see, Jesus knows that we can only truly be filled when we hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. Everything else will leave you wanting. You know, we just read that the meek shall inherit the earth. That's what this is talking about now. He says that they'll have their needs met. Their desires will be filled. The meek, they don't have to go take what they want because God's going to give them what they need. And what happens is we try to fill ourselves with things that are really not satisfying. And it just leaves us with a continual lust for more. You know, think about junk food versus healthy food, all right? I know we got some health experts in here. And junk food, Snickers really satisfies, right? No, it actually really doesn't. I mean, it does for a minute, but then it's going to leave you wanting more. It's going to leave you craving more. And when we eat junk food, it tastes good, and we may feel full at first, but does it really bring satisfaction? Does it really give you what your body really needs? And if, you, if all you eat is junk food, okay, I'm not trying to call anybody out here, but if all we eat is junk food, eventually it takes a toll on our body. It may feel like we're getting what we want right now, but down the road, man, it leaves us wanting and in a bad place. The same is true spiritually. You know, think about what are you feeding your soul? Are you hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God. You know, this picture here, it's a sad picture, right? For those watching online, I've got a picture of these two dogs. And this dog on, on your left is, um, it, it's just, it's sad. The ribs are showing. I mean, this thing looks like it, it's on its last leg, right? And the other dog, it's a healthy looking dog. I mean, the muscles are just kind of ripping out there. And, you know, the dog on the left, <clears throat> it's malnourished. 
its diet is lacking, it's not going to survive. It's more prone to disease and prone to starvation. But that dog on the right, it's been eating a healthy diet, filling itself up and getting fed what it really needs. And I would ask us this morning, spiritually speaking, which one are you? Are you just kind of barely making it through? Man, you're, you're so lean. Your ribs are showing. You don't know if you're going to make it through another week or another year. Or are you that healthy dog? I'm not calling you a dog, but you know what I'm saying. Like you, you're just you're ready to go. You're ready to go for a walk, man. You want to play. You want to do whatever because you're strong and you're healthy. Are you satisfied or is it never enough? You always got to have the next thing. You're trying to grab onto something that's going to satisfy your soul. Never enough money, never enough stuff, never enough pleasure, just always wanting and craving more. And you know what? It will never be enough. If we try to fill ourselves with things other than God, it will never, never be enough. You know, the thing about this picture, it's actually the same dog. This is the same dog. It was found, and it was malnourished, and it was a sickly dog, and it was about to die, and and they just gave it what it needed. They just filled it up with the right things, and it became this healthy, strong dog. I don't care where we're at this morning. I don't care if you feel like I'm, I'm beyond that dog. You know, that dog's good compared to me on the left. I don't care where we're at. If you start to to hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God, God's going to take care of you. He's going to fill you up. He's going to meet your needs. It's time to get healthy. Time to be filled with the righteousness of God. You know, these are the attitudes, if you will, the posture of a disciple of Jesus. And we're not going to be able to finish all these today. We're going to wrap it up here. But next week, we'll finish the Beatitudes. But I just want to close with a reminder. These aren't things we're just supposed to go and do, right? This is who we need to be. This is going to take some reflection. It takes having others around us in our lives saying, hey, how do you see this in me? Am I meek? Am I poor in spirit? Am I hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God? When was the last time you asked someone into your life? You you sat down with someone, just had a good spiritual conversation about what you could do to be more of who God wants you to be in your character, in your life. If you don't have that person in your life, get someone today. I I promise you, someone in this room will be that person for you. If you're watching online, give us a call. Somebody can get in there. We all need those people in our lives, amen? Think about these Beatitudes, pray about them, and, and change the way you think. This week, let's repent. Let's become who God wants us to be. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And to God be the glory. Thank you. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to uh, sing. Father, we are grateful that uh, you have given us uh, everything, that you have taught us uh, how to be, how to think, um, and how to act. And Father, we pray that uh, we can take to heart uh, your message, that you have called us to repent, uh, to come to you, and to see our our desperate need uh, for you in our lives. And uh, we're grateful that uh, you have uh, put a path before us that we can uh, seek out righteousness and be saved. And we're grateful for you this morning. We love you, pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How He loves me.
friend we have have in Jesus. Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Uh, Anybody involved in the baptism, so the family and the people that were in there can come on up. Uh, I believe we are ending the Sunday service live stream and starting the Elijah getting baptized live stream. So uh, we're going to, is that, is that all ready? Are we? Yeah, 